We ready? Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about cross-site scripting as a risk and cross-site scripting as a, uh, a defensive uh, strategy that we need in order to stop this very dangerous risk. And cross-site scripting in itself seems very simple to defend against. When we look deeply into the operation of a web application, especially a modern web application, cross-site scripting defense begins to get rather difficult in some areas. So uh, hopefully I'm going to spend some time with you today and talk about, first of all, from the beginning, what is cross-site scripting? We'll look at an example of some attacks. We will um, we'll, uh, look at, we'll talk about how to test for it in some ways and we'll spend most of our time together in the next hour and a half talking about defense, which is kind of complex. And one of the primary languages I'm gonna talk about in this section is Java. Who here is a Java programmer? So good, so I'll, I'm mostly gonna address the Java programming language, but these techniques and this kind of defense is pretty much the same in every programming language. Shall we go? Are you ready? Are we ready? Yes, I'm okay. Are we ready? Yes. There we go. This is me. I'm Jim Manico. I'm basically a software developer, one of the board members of OWASP. So let's get to it. Cross-site scripting. What is it? Let's look at the name cross-site scripting to start with. It's a misnomer. A misnomer is a bad name. So cross-site scripting, it's a scripting attack, and they're saying it's cross-site which means a different website needs to host it or the attack will need another website to send the data to. Not every attack is cross-site in this category. The better name for this risk, vulnerability, whatever you want to call it, attack payload, some call it, it's really just JavaScript injection. It's when the attacker can inject evil JavaScript into your website so another user, another victim, will execute that evil JavaScript. Let's dig in. Let's start here. Here's an example of some a very common cross-site scripting attacks. And I talked about in the keynote as well, but let's go over this one more time. This is going to be really important to set the tone for the rest of our time together today. So imagine that we've all logged into a website together. And we're now all in a chat forum. We'll call it the Sec App Dev, uh, Sec App Dev um, Security Forum. And yo, yo, before I forget, we need more community at Sec App Dev. We start a Sec App Dev list so we can talk about these things after the conference. I'll be happy to set that up. So more community. Now suppose we're not, we now we do that community. We build the Sec App Dev website, and we all get our high security multi-factor logins to the SecAppDev website, and now we can all chat back and forth on this secure website. But we hired someone who's cheap and they didn't know about cross-site scripting, so suppose this website has all this cross-site scripting in it. So now I chat to you, how, I'm logged in, you're logged in too. And just review, when you're logged in to a website, how do they know you're logged in with every request? <clears throat> how does a website know that you're logged in. I'm sorry? A session key, a session, session management? And where is that session ID saved normally? Where is that stored? It's in a cookie. So all of a sudden, we log in with the password, and the, the, the cookies and the security of those cookies are very, very important. And so now, we're logged in, we have our session cookies, and I chat to you, hello, how are you? Aloha from Hawaii. And I add in this script here that we see in the first example. So the new script opens up, and we're about to do window.location. What does window.location do in JavaScript? Hmm? It redirects you to a new site. Now, this, we're not redirected yet. We're still setting up the URL. So the URL we're about to redirect you to, I'm the attacker, you're the victim, so I'm gonna force you to redirect to evileviljim.com. This is not a real site. Don't register it yet, I'm gonna register it. So, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna force you to redirect to evileviljim.com, a site that I have control over. 
But what am I adding to this URL? What am I adding to the URL here? Document.cookie. Which cookie is this? It, it is, but is it the cookie to evilevilgym.com or is it the cookie to SecApp Dev's chat board? It's SecApp Dev's cookie that you logged into, that, that you use multi-factor to log into because it's all secure. And now I give you this script, it grabs a copy of your cookie, adds it to a URL, and redirects you to evilevilgym.com. Now guess what I see in my logs now? Your session cookie. And I'm, I'm logged in as me, I take out my session cookie, I put your session cookie in, and I am now you. I am now authenticated as if I am you. Then I can go to Yo and go, Yo, we need to make sure we have Jim Manico giving all presentations next year. That would be a terrible attack. That would ruin everything. So that's the first one. That's a session theft. This is a really simplified but real session theft attack using cross-site scripting. What does the second one do? This is site defacement. This is a, um, a simple script that I send to you. And as soon as you read that message, uh, it executes document, that's the whole document, dot body, just the body of the document, dot inner HTML. The whole HTML of the body of your page now gets turned, now gets changed to blink, Owen oh, is cool, blink, boom. So I just, mod I have now have the ability to modify the entire page. These are very simple attacks. When we're done today, I'll, I'll take out my computer and I'll show you some examples of this, some live attacks. I'm, I'm gonna stay in this setup for now though. Oops, there we go. So here's an example of a series of other cross-site scripting attacks. Stealing the session, defacing the site, we just looked at those two. We can use this attack to undermine cross-site request forgery defenses. You can use, like for example, um, who here knows what cross-site scripting is? I'm sorry, who here knows what cross-site request forgery is? What's the main defense to stop cross-site request forgery? A cryptographic token, a cryptographic nonce. Other people call it the synchronizer token pattern in design theory. So all this means is with every request, with every uh, form or sensitive feature that we build for a user as a programmer, I'm gonna add a per user random token into that form so it can't be predicted what the value, what the value is. And if that token um, is, does not match what's being saved for that user on the server, the request gets rejected. Now we can use cross-site scripting to get around that. If I can get cross-site scripting into your site, that code can basically um, load, uh, 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 make a request to a form, grab a copy of that form, parse it in JavaScript and rip out the token, put the token in a new request and submit the request with the token just by using a cross-site scripting attack. So we can undermine many different kinds of cross-site request forgery defenses when cross-site scripting is ex exists in your site. So when we look at cross-site request forgery defensive techniques, you first must be fully immune to cross-site scripting and you also need to add the, the uh, cross-site request forgery tokens in as well. We, it, it depends on the, the way it was architected. But even if the token is separate for every form, my cross-site scripting attack would just load the form, grab a copy of the form, grab the token and resubmit the form and to the application it's just that one token. So cross-site cross -site scripting perfect defense is a requirement to really stop cross-site request forgery in most cases. As a quick aside, what I like to do for cross-site request forgery, if the transaction is very sensitive, I just force reauthentication, make them log in again and then cross-site scripting attacks cannot undermine it. That's one good defense, but it's, if you make the user have to log in again too much, it hurts usability. So you can steal any data with cross-site scripting. You can set up a keystroke logger with cross-site scripting. 
you trap the key up and key down events and send a, a request out over Ajax with that, uh, um, with that key press. And we're seeing attackers use this more and more frequently uh, because it's uh, getting harder to do SQL injection. So in the wild, we see more and more of this. So far, so good. This basic, basic introductory stuff about this risk. So let's look at, here's a, uh, an example of a coding pattern here that causes cross-site scripting. So we have a URL to some website and there's save comment and the comment is some text that they want displayed on site. And normally the, pro, the user wouldn't type in great site. This is a, the user may have submitted a form with some comments and then, okay, let's close that out. So, yeah, this is not someone typing in the word great site in this URL. Someone may have submitted a form to the, uh, someone may have submitted a form to the server and what came back was comments rendered on page. And in this case, the programmer didn't embed the comments in the page itself. They put the comments in the URL so we can use all, so we can make all different kinds of comments without having to code it differently every time. This is a, a programmer being lazy. It's okay. There's smart lazy and there's dangerous lazy. This is dangerous lazy. So, um, in this case, whatever is typed into the comment will just display on screen. So we could put JavaScript in this URL like the attacks I showed you earlier. We could just add this text to the end of the URL here, mail that URL or email it or text this URL to someone else, they click on it, boom, the attack executes. That's called reflective cross-site scripting. And there's three different kinds of XSS we need to worry about. Reflective, stored, and DOM-based cross-site scripting. Reflective cross-site scripting is what I'm showing you right here on screen. We have a comment in the URL, great site, and whenever that URL is executed, whatever's in the URL parameter for comment gets reflected on screen. This attack isn't saved in your database ever. This attack is only in the URL, so it's hard to detect if an attack is deep in your site. So this is reflective. We'll, 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 uh, um, I can show you examples of this after class as well if you want to see some real world examples. We also have stored XSS. What do I mean by stored XSS? Mr. Ty. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Exactly right. What do you think is more dangerous? This is debatable. Do you think stored or reflective is more dangerous? That's really insightful, I agree. Reflective is like a targeted attack, like an arrow against one person, where stored is like a landmine. Anybody who walks over it will trip that, that danger. And some people think that reflective is more dangerous. Uh, this is just a debate. Stored cross-site scripting implants this attack in your database. So I could use a tool like anti sami or a tool like the HTML sanitizer to walk through my database and look for attacks. I'll take input, sanitize it. If they're different, there may be XSS in there. I think stored is more dangerous in the real world. Some people think it's reflective because you can't see the attack. You can't look into your application to see if an attack exists. Where if it's stored, I can look through the database and see the attack. So whatever. To us, it doesn't matter. We want to stop all of these the defense is the same regardless of the kind of attack in play here. There's also DOM-based XSS. This is much more complex. Reflective is when it's in the URL. Stored is when it's, it gets saved to your database. And DOM XSS is when the attack launches deep within JavaScript code, usually through asynchronous communication. Everyone has a different definition of what DOM XSS is. This is very debatable. My opinion of DOM XSS is when you make a request to a website, the vulnerability comes into your web page, it doesn't launch yet, and by interacting with the web page and clicking events and doing 
uh, like, like if you were in Google Calendar and it was supposed it was vulnerable, and uh, when the calendar first loads, no problem. But when you click at the bottom to highlight a certain color, boom, the attack launches. That's Dom XSS to me. Other people have different definitions. Amit, who invented this, he has a, a different idea of what this is. But irregardless, the defense for this category is going to be deep in JavaScript. We're going to have to, to stop Dom XSS. We're going to have to avoid certain dangerous APIs in JavaScript and design our JavaScript code in a very specific way to avoid this risk. So these, these are the different kinds of attacks in the XSS world. And by the way, some people do not think of XSS as a vulnerability. Some people think it's just a payload. And they're right. XSS by itself is not an attack. SQL injection means you're, you know, you're damaging the database. XSS is just a payload. It's like a, a, it's, a, it's the missile with no warhead. The real warhead is this kind of stuff. The real attack is, I'm going to deface your site. The real attack is, I'm going to steal your session. But I, I digress. So here's reflective. Let's, let's look at these attacks one more time. Here's reflective. The victim views a web page uh, via an XSS link supplied by the attacker. The attacker sends you a URL, texts you a URL, over instant message sends you a URL. And what do you do when you get a URL from a stranger? What do you do right away? You click on it, right? No, you shouldn't, but, mo but most people do. Oh, a link, click. So someone sends you a link, you click on it, and then that, that page then, the request goes to the server, the request comes back, that whatever data was in the URL with the attack gets reflected back right away, and the attack launches. Let me move ahead here. Here's an example of some uh, ASPX code, some a .NET ASP code that has this vulnerability. We see that this is a web page. It's a GET request. This is the URL that launches it. Search for the word soccer. And this is the attack that actually does the damage. Search, query, with some kind of script attack added to the end of it. And here we see that raw request data is being reflected right back without any kind of defense built in. So here's a stored XSS. Please note the animation we got for you. Very exciting, exciting animation. Stored XSS is when the attacker doesn't target the victim directly. They're, they're making a request to the server and implanting the attack in the server in some way, in the database, by saving data. Like one, one attack I've seen recently is the attacker would take their own profile, their own user profile, and in the user profile you have a description. Tell us about yourself, right? Hi, my name is Jim. I'm a 40-year-old male, and I live on Hawaii. I like Hawaiian shirts, and I'm married, so keep away. Whatever. And so I might put the attack in my profile and hit save. Now, how can I get someone to look at my profile that I want to target? Ah, so I'll go email the administrator and say, I'm having problems with my profile. Can you please look at that for me? And what will the admin do? Oh, I'll go look at the profile. While what? While they're, usually while they're logged in as admin, they'll look at the profile and the attack launches. That's stored XSS. And here's an example of source code that has the same vulnerability. We're grabbing an ID from the request, we're building a query, we're retrieving the comment from the database, and the comment from the database is being rendered with no protection. This is how the attack launches. So now anybody who looks at this article will launch the attack. This is a comment in an article of some kind. DOM-based XSS is a bit different. And so this is the attack is usually targeted directly at the user. It's often not saved in the database like a reflective attack. And so in this case, we have, um, oops. We still have the attack launched in a reflective way. And it's executed very similar to a reflective attack, but it's, it's happening through JavaScript. So it's not just rendered on a page directly, it's through some JavaScript API. In my opinion, this isn't the best example. I'd prefer this to be on, an, on a click event. Like if this was an event, hi, Jim, 
And if you click here, it activates. That's more of what I think is DOM XSS. So how do we test for this? Yes, please. Why should it be a this is just, this is a mis I move. I tried to move away fast. This is just a reflective, in my opinion. This is not DOM XSS. Yeah, but Tell me that. Tell me that one more time, sir. No, I, I didn't hear you. This is super. I'm, I'm I'm splitting hairs here. Some people think that that's just another stored attack. If it's stored in the database and it's embedded in the page, some people call that stored. And so according to the real theory of DOM XSS, the attack is saved in like a hashtag or something where it, it's not saved in the database. And even when you, make a, when you make a request to the server of this nature, when you do something like, like cnn.com and you know, theater, I'm just making this up, and then you do bump a jump link to like the bottom, right? When you make a request to the server like this, the server disregards this and doesn't save it in any way in most servers. So the original DOM XSS research says put the attack in here so the server never records it and it's targeted specifically at an individual. I have a different take on this. This is very debatable stuff. So we actually, Dave Wickers did some research on this and went back and tried to redefine what DOM XSS is. And Amit, I think Amit Klein is the original writer of the DOM XSS original article. He's like, no, my definition stands. So let, let me talk about it from a defensive point of view to end this debate. Forgive this poor example, but um, if, the, if you have to just do output encoding in a, user, in a page, that's usually stored or reflective. If you have to make changes deep in JavaScript, I usually think of that as DOM-based defense needed. So I kind of, in my own mind, I, I'm not, I don't care about the attack type. I care about how you defend. So, so DOM-based DOM XSS defense is a whole special category I'll talk about. The other point I want to make is that, um, no, I'll, 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 I'll say that for later. Yeah, like you can have a reflective XSS that's DOM executable. Or you can have a reflective XSS that just executes on the page. Or you could, so there's a comp, I, I think of DOM XSS as one part of the axis and reflective is stored as a different one. You may have DOM or page, you may have reflective or stored. So you could have a stored DOM or a stored page. This is again, very debatable, it's probably going too far for today. Let's, let's, let's do this, move on. <laughs> well, let's talk about this later though, it's a good point. I it's, just, it's a comp complicated issue, I'm, so I'm probably, I'll, I'll, I'm probably going to do this for future classes. We'll do this. We'll do delete, and we'll do delete, and we'll just move on. There we go. Well, anyways, so how do we test? It's pretty easy to test for cross-site scripting, I think. Um, you're going to insert malicious scripts into the page. You're going to save malicious scripts through different form fields. You modify the cookie and add script tags. Uh, modify URL parameters with script and see what pops. The way testers mostly do XSS testing is with an alert box. They want to see if an alert will pop. Once an alert pops, that means you can get JavaScript to execute and you're done. When I talk to developers, I prefer to show them tests like this. Because if you do an alert pop to a developer, they're like, so what? You made an alert pop. But if I can show them stealing a cookie or modifying the page, they go, oh, I see. So I think as security professionals, it's really important that we show developers real world attacks. And there are plenty of XSS attack kits you can use to demonstrate some fa fancy things. In my own work, when I wanna show XSS, I either show like installing of a third part of a plugin that we created that man the middles in the browser. Cause I can use XSS to, call, to, to force a Firefox plugin dialog to pop up. If they hit okay, it installs my evil plugin, and now I got man, the man in the browser, and I own you completely. 
or I'll show like a key logger being set up, or I'll open up two websites, the victim website and my collection evil website, and I'll attack a login page with XSS, so as they're logging in, we see every keystroke appear on the evil website. I want to encourage you, when you're showing these vulnerabilities to a developer, show them a real attack. Hit them hard and show them a real, because once you build this attack once, you can reuse it over and over again. That's very important when working with developers. So how do we stop cross-site scripting? How do we stop this risk? That's what we're going to talk about for the rest of today. What do you think? I'm sorry? Valid validation's a part of it, I agree. What's that? Output encoding is a much more important part of the defense. Be bear with me, and you're right, and you're right, you're more right. That's gonna be the main defense we'll talk about today. It's, it's called a data, I call it data sanitization. I wanna take input, The combination of input validation, output encoding, um, it's a, uh, avoiding certain APIs, parsing JSON correctly, doing HTML policy-based sanitization, it's many things. The most important technique is output encoding. When we're, and we'll talk about this within the next like 15 minutes. So you're still right. The theory of injection protection is you protect the parser as close to the parser as possible. So when we're doing SQL injection protection, right when we're building the query, we add the encoding through a query, through query parameterization. Input validation is far away from where we actually use that data. So a lot can happen between input and the query. If we protect the query itself, we're better off. It's the same is true in cross-site scripting. When we're building our HTML page and putting data from the database into the page, that's the, in, that's the parser boundary. That's where untrusted data meets the HTML parser when we're building the user interface. So if we add our protection into that user interface, that's the most potent way to protect because it's, it's closest to the parser, which is the, the web renderer. So if we add the right encoding, the theory is regardless of what evil data goes to my user interface, if I apply the, if I apply the right encoding function, I'm safe no matter what. So yes, maybe you want to encode in your database, you're going to want to do HTML validation, um, you're, going to, you're going to want to do input validation, but protecting your user interface templates is most important in my opinion. So we'll talk about this more, I promise you. So let's talk about how we used to defend against this in the past. So let's, so you're up, are you ready? You're up, good, you're, I know you're smart. So you're, you're, so look at this, suppose I tell you, so let's go back to 1990 now. Woohoo, 1990, big hair, Prince, you know, whatever. Right, was Prince in 1990 or? What's, what's a Prince song, go ahead. Anyone know? No one can sing Little Prince for me, no? What was 1990, Pearl Jam? All right, moving on. Suppose I told you your defense was, um, you must eliminate all dangerous characters from the application, right? That's, so you're gonna do input validation and strip out the big six, less than, greater than, ampersand, double quote, single quote, slash. So what do you think about that? What's that? But what's, why, why will this not work though? This doesn't work. This is a bad idea. What if I tell you, you have to strip out every single single quote that you get in an input field, rip it out, and you're safe. So what fields need a single quote? Exactly, or what if you're like, where, what, 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 where are we? Where, uh, well, I'm sleeping where? In the Irish college, right? So suppose we have a first name, last name field for the Irish college. And what happens when the Irishmen come over from Ireland? We want to go to Irish college, where's our Guinness? And they go to type in their name, 
What's their name? O'Shea, O'Malley. And my name is Jim Manico. So the, when I go to Ireland, they, had, they, made me, they made me an official Irishman. So my Irish name is Jim O'Manic. So I like that. And I type in O'Manic. What happens? You strip out my, the character out of my last name. What, how do you think an Irishman likes having the single quote ripped out of his last name? Do you think he likes that? They drink and they fight really good. Don't mess with the Irish. So we need these dangerous characters for our application to work. See, this is why application security is so different than network security, right? It's because um, in network security, you detect and block attacks, ACLs and different rules at the firewall level, and you keep attacks out of your network is the theory. And it's not exactly correct, but close enough. In application security, we want to take this attack and authenticate it safely, authorize it safely, put it in the database safely, retrieve it from the database safely, and render the attack in an HTML page all safely. That's real application security to me. That's why output encoding is so important, because we, it's like it's, we assume it's an attack, but if we output encode it, it's never going to launch. If we output encode it correctly, it's never going to launch. Food for thought. This won't work because, you know, it's total fail. We need these dangerous characters for even simple web applications to work properly, for business functionality. So we also said to do, so this is now around the year 2000. We realized that input validation is not good enough. So we do output encoding, doing HTML entity encoding. We replace the less than character with an ampersand LT semicolon, and now we neutralize the attack. When the, what, what does the browser do when it sees the less than sign? It tries to start a new HTML tag, like a script tag. When the browser sees an ampersand LT semicolon, it just displays it a less than on screen. That's an HTML entity. But this is not enough because we have so many other places to put untrusted data in a web page, an attribute, um, inside of a URL, a link we're going to build, or uh, in a cascading style sheet value. And we have all these different slots in an HTML document. We need a different kind of encoder, depending where it's going to go on the web page. Different contexts in the body, in an attribute, in style, in a JavaScript variable assignment within a URL all different contexts of display. And so this is close to what we recommend today. We say, um, let me start with number two. We, in, we do input validation to restrict input as best as we can. In my own code, I use two kinds of validation. I use whitelist validation, the most important to define what, um, what data should be as minimally as possible. I also use blacklist validation looking for known attacks or certain attack signatures. Um, like if I see the word, uh, anyways, I, I digress. And then we want to do output encoding based on where the input lands in the web page. I'm going to talk about these different contexts in great detail today. So this is the defense that we talked about in 2007. We said in the body of the HTML document, do HTML entity encoding. In the attribute of an HTML document, do HTML attribute encoding. Um, in a, for a JavaScript variable assignment, we put untrusted data in a JavaScript variable for some AJAX feature or some JavaScript feature. We do JavaScript hex output encoding. If we're putting untrusted data in a cascading style sheet value, like a width of a page that was driven by user input, we do cascading style sheet hex output encoding. Or if we're putting untrusted data in a URL as a get parameter, we do standard percent encoding, which is part of the URI standard. Um, and so on. These are the different defenses we said a few years ago. But this is not going to work either. This is bad advice. And because encoding alone is not enough in some situations. So here's a problem we had with the OWASP ESAPI project. The OWASP ESAPI project, I think of it as a research project. It's not production quality at all. And uh, in this project, we are. Um, we made a cascading style sheet, a CSS encoder, so you can put untrusted data into a style safely. 
unfortunately, we got, we got this email back in February of 2009 where someone had broken through our encoder and was, was able to uh, cause, cause cross-site scripting even when they used the proper encoder. And here's an example of that attack. This attack only pops, first of all, in IE6 and IE7. Every browser has its own different, unique eccentricities around how they deal with HTML. And every browser now has their own special tags or features that other browsers don't support. So look at this attack. So temp3, this is the untrusted data, this variable right here. So in this code, we get, um, we get the data from the request and put it in the width here. Now, no validation, just direct rendering here. And what the, what the person did, and this is a little out of order, I'm sorry. So what the person did here is they have temp3, and temp3 is the untrusted data, and they did a sappy dot encoder encode for CSS. This is the right encoder. We told them to do that. And here's the attack that they got through. They used an expression. An expression is a like a, a JavaScript function that you can execute inside of IE6 and IE7 only. So I can say expression, which means launch this JavaScript inside of style, makes no sense, to run this. And so this expression, even when encoded, here's the actual text after encoding, this will actually execute in IE6 and 7, making the encoder not good enough for certain browsers. It's a pain. So um, here's other problems we see today. So we have Adam Barth here. Adam Barth is, pr is probably one of the smartest guys out there. Adam Barth is like one of the creators of Chrome, one of the main developers in Chrome. And he suggested that we build web pages this way back in 2011. Now, Adam Barth is a smart guy. I'm not trying to give him a hard time. But the advice he said was, number one, first load your web page, make a request, load the web page with static content only, and then make another request and grab JSON from the server and parse the JSON and populate the DOM dynamically. This is a very common Web 2.0 architecture. So we take that untrusted data from JSON, or I'm sorry, we take, yeah, we take the untrusted data from JSON and we use JavaScript APIs like Node Text Context, um, uh, Node Text Content, Document Create Text Node, Element Set Attribute, and we dynamically populate the DOM. Facebook and other modern applications were written this way. But this is not enough. Because element set attribute, element set attribute, the one at the bottom, that's the most dangerous of all JavaScript methods. You can set attributes like um, uh, on click or on blur, all these event handlers, which are attributes, and cause, you know, and cause untrusted data to execute. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is even the advice that we get from some of the smartest people who do web technology is still often not good enough advice if we look back from the last couple of years. We need something different. So this is kind of where I'm at today around XSS defense. This is where, the, this is where our time really starts today. How am I on time, speaking of time? Perfect. Let's, let's rock. The, again, this character is incredibly important. It starts a lot of XSS attacks. Not all, but many. And we want to do output encoding. We want to convert it to a safe context. When you see ampersand LT semicolon in the browser, it renders a less than sign, but does not start a new tag. It's visual only. This is a really important concept. And so there are many ways to do output encoding in a web page for different characters. There's your decimal entity, your HTML entity, Unicode encoding for certain contexts. So we have all these different encoded, encoded versions of dangerous characters that we're going to want to encode in our encoders. And this is my view of how to stop XSS today. Different encoding um, based on the context. We have, uh, we have different kind of validation for things like untrusted HTML. We have to avoid certain APIs for DOM XSS defense. We have to do sandboxing if it's a third-party JavaScript. There's not really good options there. And we also want to parse JSON or parse XML, depending on your architecture, in a safe way. So, so this is complicated. 
It's more than just encoding. It's more than just validation. It's a whole design life cycle that developers need to be aware of to really stop this risk. And that's a problem. There we go. So this is a good question. Let's go, let's look at, like a, if you have an unquoted attribute in HTML, let's take a look at this. Make sure I don't break anything. So let's, let's look at this, yo. Suppose I'm doing this. I'm, I'm, I have some tag ID equals and I'm going to put untrusted data right in here. How, if it's not quoted, all I need to break out of this is a space. Like my attack here could be the number one, a space, and then on click equals my attack. And so I normally won't encode a space. That's a lot of encoding. But if I'm doing attribute encoding, I usually will encode the space. I'm more aggressive in terms of what characters I encode if I'm putting data in an attribute context. Now, suppose it's a formal template. Suppose, suppose it's a formal template where I can just do this, where the quotes are already are forced. So a, form, a formal template language like Apache Velocity or other formal templating systems, they won't let you do unquoted attributes. So if I know for sure the attribute is going to be encoded, I can just do basic HTML entity encoding. Less characters. I just need to encode the big six or less. So can't you do the same thing basically, but supply the ending quote, just as you're doing the The programmer, um, if, if the programmer is using an older legacy system, the, 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 the quotes won't be there necessarily. And we can't guarantee those quotes will be there. So we want to encode more aggressively. Most people that I know, they've combined the first two use cases into one function and they call it a day. Am I, answer, am I answering your question fairly or not enough? Or? Uh, like other safer, like if I was just doing this, if I, if I had this like an eight, if, let me see, like a, like a span. <laughs> like a span tag and untrusted data went between two span tags, I can get away with encoding just a few characters. As long as I encode less than, greater than, ampersand, single quote, double quote, slash, that's enough encoding. So that's the, that, that's the research I'm, uh, I see a lot of people doing today is the question is not how to do encoding, but what's the absolute least necessary encoding I can get away with and still be secure? Do I have net access on here? Probably not. Uh, I could show you. I'm, I'm okay for now. What I can do is um, there's a, a web page at OWASP called the, it's called a min, um, XSS Minimal Encoding Experimental. This is a, the, a set of rules written by Jeff Ikonowski who wrote the OWASP Java encoder specifying the absolute least necessary characters because he's, he's concerned with performance and minimizing uh, how much bytes go to the browser for speed. A lot of people care about that. Performance matters. If you decouple performance from security, you're, I think you're off base. Performance, functionality, and security all need to be considered together. So a lot of the earlier encoders from Microsoft and OWASP and other researchers were incredibly slow and doesn't work in the real world in many cases. So we need high performance controls to work in the real world. And I'll, I'll point some of these out before we're done today. So here's the basic context. We have untrusted data. This is like a Java server page or an active server page or a PHP file where we're dynamically building the user interface. Here's an attack example. In this case, we just do HTML entity encoding. Here we have untrusted data landing in an attribute value. It's quoted here. We just do some kind of um, HTML entity encoding. In the .NET library, they have a separate function. Encode in the .NET anti-XSS library and the ASAPI project, these are all separate functions. Encoder, encode for HTML attribute. So 
Here we have a get parameter value. This is common in search engines. Like if you go to uh, like Yahoo search engine and you type in the word uh, Apple, the search executes and you see, before your search results, you see your search results for the term Apple, right? And you can click on Apple and re-trigger the search. Or you may do a search on barrel of apples. So it will say your search results for the terms barrel of apples is as follows. And all three of those are going to be linkable. You can click on it and re-trigger that search. So I'm taking the word Apple, which is not safe data. That came from the user. And I'm putting it in another URL that the user may want to click on. Part of the URL, the black part of the URL, is trusted. It's hard-coded by the developer. But another part of that URL, this, the query, the value here, is untrusted. So we want, what kind of encoding do we do here? We do percent encoding. This is, a, this is the, you know, the, the standard encoding you do for, in it for um, like spaces. Or, uh, this is the standard encoding you do for text inside of, a, inside of a URL, just part of the URL standard. And that will also eliminate cross-site scripting. And this standard, this standard will convert a space to a plus and, and non-alphanumeric characters to percent in some hex value. So almost every language in existence on the web has this, this function built in. This is a, a, a more specialized case. I'm going to spend some time on this. What if we have an untrusted URL? What do I mean by that? Anybody here tweets on the Twitters? Does anybody here have a Twitter account? Please, okay. So what is one of the, a very common thing that people like to tweet are URLs, right? So like I'm on vacation, I take a picture of my wife, and I take that URL, I, I, I upload her image, to some website and I tweet that URL. Or I see some fascinating article at, at some news site and I grab a copy of that, of that article and I tweet that URL. Now think of what Twitter has to do here. What is that URL? When, when Twitter gets the tweet and wants to save it to their NoDB database or whatever, what is the URL in the tweet? What is it really? It's just a, I'm sorry? It's just a string. So how does, and when, when, you, when Twitter then shows that tweet to other people, it's all linkable, correct? If you tweet a, a URL to a news article, Twitter has to receive that as a string, then they render it to someone else and they make it linkable. That's actually a very complex workflow. Twitter got hit with cross-site scripting and that specific feature over and over and over again a couple of years back. You can see the attack, it's the Mikey goat worm that hit them to exploit that vulnerability. Here's how you fix this problem though. It's kind of, it's a little, little tricky here. So the tweet comes in, we're now a Twitter server. I have this 140 character tweet. I got to figure out which one of these is a real URL. So I have a regular expression or some kind of validation that checks for a URL pattern. And I check the first word. So suppose we tweet, check out this great article. So we look at the word check. Is that a URL? Regular expression? No. This. Is that a URL? No. And uh, URL. That's not a, and then we have something starting with HTTP colon slash slash CNN.com. Ah, that matches my pattern for a URL. We also want to make sure it's, it's not a JavaScript URL. That will just pop in some browsers. We want to make sure it's an HTTP or an HTTPS URL only. So even a legal URL can still have a cross-site scripting attack in it. You can have a less than sign. You can have the word script in a parameter. So that, say that legal URL may still have an attack in it. So when we take the URL and we render it in the link, like we see here on the screen, how do we encode it? When you put the, when you, because the URL on Twitter, you see it like a full URL. So when we put the URL in an href tag, the actual link, we do HTML attribute encoding here. When we put the URL in the actual display portion of the link, we do, we do normal HTML entity encoding. And we do more aggressive attribute encoding here. And then we're, then we're much safer. Then we, now, we, now we have this whole workflow of untrusted URLs in a safe way. For bonus points, check if the URL contains malware. There's the open Google malware URL verification API. There's commercial products to do this. 
So this is the workflow to just handle a simple tweet with a simple URL to a simple news article. It's actually underneath the hood, it's quite complicated to do that safely, yet still avoid cross-site scripting. Yeah, I, I, uh, so when you're doing anti-malware verification, you have to um, take the minified URL, uh, uh, unminify it, and then traverse. And there, it might be a minified URL to a minified URL to a minified URL to a piece of, to a legal website that redirects you to malware. So it's, it is more complicated. To stop XSS at the time of rendering the URL, we just need to do the proper encoding. But to check for malware is much, much more difficult. We have to dig and traverse and to see if it's malware. So the malware problem's tough, but, but doing the XSS defense is easy, I dare say. Is it done with the malware checking? Hmm? Is it done with the malware checking? The malware checking, does it lose? No? Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 what I do know from my own code is the best malware checker I've seen Google has an open web service API to check if a URL is malware or not. They tend to do a pretty good job. It beats most commercial products that do this. So. The problem with the URLs is that we actually can be any differently if Google is printing them, you're printing them, or why you're going to develop them. You're not sure that if you're clicking, you will end up with the same URL page as the one that you're clicking on. I, I have, a random, I have a little random chunk of code in there. Every 10th page, every 10th time I render this URL, then add the malware. Or if, the, if, if it's being launched from California, don't show the malware. But it's being, if it's being launched from Leuven, do show the malware. That's easy code to do. And again, my, yeah. You, you can't win this, the, you can never, it's asymmetric warfare. So our con, what our concern is, is the untrusted URL legal? And can we stop XSS at the time of rendering it on page? That's our responsibility for the most part as developers. And by validating it's a legal URL, HTTP, HTTPS only, and doing the encoding as we build the URL, that's good enough. That eliminates XSS at the time our page renders. Now, if someone may click that link to a different site and execute it over there, that's not, usually not our concern. If we do some kind of malware checking, it's reasonable. So what I, a way to make malware checking more effective is you don't do the malware check when you first get the URL. You do the malware check as you render it on, 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 on the way out. Because of malware, as I get it on input, the malware checker may say, there's no malware here. And then three days later when I render it, someone may have added malware to that page. So the safest way to do it is to check as you render the URL on the way out, maybe once an hour or once a day, to, and, and you keep that going, eventually someone reports it as malware, and then you stop. And you, then you remove all those links from your site. But I agree with you, this is a war. No, what I mean is like, when do you check a URL if it has malware or not? When the, when the tweet is first sent to Twitter? Or when he looks at my Twitter feed a week from now and, ha and has that link from the Twitter database sent to his browser? When, what's that? Um, th think of the workflow this way. So. He sends a tweet, I'm Twitter, he's the tweeter, and he's the reader. He's reading his feed, I am Twitter. So he submits a tweet to me and says, says, hello everybody, great day in Leuven, check out this link. And there's no malware on this link. So it's in my database, and he looks at the feed. Here you go, I give it to you. And it's safe, he looks at the link, he clicks on it, sees a picture of whatever, and everything's good. Two days later, he controls that page, he swaps it out and puts in a bunch of malware, a big malware dropper. So the URL is still in my database. So he comes and looks at my database and gets the URL and malware hits him. So as a good defensive coder, 
whenever I have a tweet and I'm gonna send it to someone else, that's the most important place to check if malware exists in the URL that's in the text of the tweet. And so uh, that's called, that's like output malware checking. Same for virus protection. We do it once an hour or once a day. Yeah, well, I built this kind of system for like uh, other file systems. We're, we're way off topic, by the way, so I'm sorry. Um, more malware at, at, at a nine o'clock at Irish College with the beer, so let's, let's charge. Here we have untrusted data landing in a, in a style context. So in this context, we're, uh, this is the problem with expressions. So really, don't do this. If you, if you still have to support older browsers, this is, a design, this is something we just don't need to do. Why should untrusted data drive your style? There are better ways to do this, like building multiple styles a user can pick from. Input itself shouldn't, shouldn't drive style because it's a very fragile part of the browser rendering engine. So just keep away from this is my recommendation. So here we have untrusted data landing in a JavaScript variable assignment or a function call that's basically another JavaScript variable. In this case, we want to do JavaScript hex output encoding in .NET encode for JavaScript. In SAPI encode for JavaScript. In the Java encoder, there's multiple JavaScript encoders we'll look at a little bit later. Also want to parse JSON in a safe way. Use JSON.parse or use a server-side sanitizer. JSON.parse is slow. A server-side sanitizer can allow you to eval JSON with the eval function, which is dangerous, but very, very fast. We'll talk about this in just a bit as well. So let's, let's get into the real world now. So how do we, as a Java programmer, really stop cross-site scripting in the real world in a high-performance way, in a highly scalable way? It also, redu it also uses a minimal amount of memory in its execution. That's my goal here. I want to put out per like really enterprise SaaS quality controls, and these really haven't been available until very recently. Let's look at this. So now we have the OWASP Java Encoder Project, one of my favorite projects at, 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 at OWASP. It's a fairly obscure project too. Not a lot of people use it yet. It's, uh, it, he just, uh, he's been, um, it just got released on Valentine's Day of this year, uh, the first real heavily, heavily completed production version. No, so here's a simple Java, Java project no third-party libraries or configuration. This code's designed from the ground up for high availability, high performance computing. Uh, it's a single drop-in jar file. There's no crazy dependencies. Um, redesigned from the ground up for performance. And it's a, it's a much more complete API than other encoders. There's URI, URI component, multiple JavaScript contexts. So those of you who are building your own template language, this is a great encoder to do auto-encoding for you. It's so detailed. Every possible slot that we could think of is part of this library. And uh, last updated in, in, uh, a, a couple weeks ago, the point I'm trying to make here is it's actively being maintained by a very senior PhD level software engineer. And this is the, what I use in the real world today. Let's look at this now. So you have a web page vulnerable to cross-site scripting. We want to do output encoding to stop this risk. So here we have a, a, no, a normal input field, and we have encode for HTML attribute, a nice, concise function call. It used to be a sappy dot encoder dot encode for HTML attribute, Dro drove me nuts. This is nice and concise. One function, static call, done. I love it. Here we have a text area. So this is, a, this is HTML content. A special kind of encoding is needed for a text area. Here we have a button. An on-click handler. This is a JavaScript attribute. So we have an alert function. So we're putting untrusted data inside of an attribute for that specific, for that specific message. This is in code for JavaScript attribute. Here we have untrusted data landing in a variable assignment. So this is in code for JavaScript block. No other encoder has this level of encoding detail. And it's just came out recently. It's be, it's, uh, we use it in production at a couple very large companies over the last couple of years. This is what I encourage you to use today. And it's open source, BSD, steal it, whatever you got to do. 
So here's another use case. Let's look at this. Has anyone here ever heard of Tiny MCE? This is a, a ex very important widget. It's, it's another way where encoding is not going to work here. So in the upper left-hand corner, we see a web page with Tiny MCE embedded on it. And look, you can do bold, italics, underline, paragraph indentation, coloring, uh, put a smiley face on, embed images, whatever. And how does Tiny, when you hit submit on a Tiny MCE text area widget, how does it submit that rich text? As a chunk of HTML. Here, look at the lower right-hand corner. We have H1, image tags, paragraph tags, H2s, links. These, it's, it's a chunk of HTML. What if we tried to encode this? What if we did HTML entity encoding before we render this HTML to another user? What would happen? You would see the HTML. But the whole point of Tiny MCE is to see the, the, the fancy text in the upper left-hand corner. That's what we should see. Instead, we see this. We should see this. And so, so what's the problem? What's the solution? That's a great question, yo. So we have right here. <laughs> we have a, an HTML sanitizer. In, there's, in, in the .NET world, there's, there's anti-XSS, dot, um, get safe HTML, untrusted HTML. In PHP, there's a project called the, the HTML Purifier Project. In, um, in OWASP, traditionally we had the project Anti-SAMI. It uh, hasn't been maintained well. It's a very slow library in my opinion. Um, a little complex to use. It's, it's a reasonable choice. I use this. This is the OWASP HTML sanitizer. This is written by Michael Samuel from Google, who runs Google's application security program. He's one of the most senior programmers I know. I don't want cool security guys writing my controls. I want the best programmers in the world who have security knowledge to write my controls. So I hunted these people down and get them to donate. And this is just outstanding. So here we have a new policy factory. I'm saying allow an A tag, HTTPS only. I'm only allowing the href and A uh, elements and no relative links. Now build it and now run the, and now I can take any kind of um, untrusted HTML it will only abide by this policy and strip out everything else. So this is an HTML sanitizer, an HTML cleanser. Another Java project that does this is called JSOUP, but it's DOM-based parsing and it's very slow. That's the problem. I'm trying, to use, I'm trying to do HTML parsing in a SaaS environment that's getting has millions of users hitting it, and these traditional controls don't work. So any kind of big enterprise will have the same problem. So that's why this kind of this tool is so critical in my world. It's, it's meant for prime time. The, it's a HTML sanitizer, it's written in Java, it lets you include HTML authored by third parties, untrusted HTML. I can now embed it safely in my web pages. So this code was written with best security practices in mind. We have, it's just an amazing intensive test suite. We pulled out anti sammys test suite and JSOOP's test suite and had our own test suite. Um, the code's all open source, it's trivial to use, there's no configuration file, no death by XML, actively maintained by Mike Samuel, a few bugs were reported in it, we had him fixed and deployed within 24 hours, he cares about this. It was donated from the Kaha project in Google, so awesome, love it. Real straightforward to use. Make sense everyone? Is this, is this, is this helpful information to your world? Good. So how about parsing JSON? So let's talk about this for a second. There are two use cases where you need to parse JSON. And what is JSON, first of all? What, what is inside of a JSON object? What's that? I agree. But when I say JSON, I'm really just talking about a chunk of it's just a chunk of JavaScript, exactly. JSON is a standard that's a subset of JavaScript object notation. So when I say a chunk of JSON, it's the same thing as saying a chunk of JavaScript that abides by a certain standard. So we have this JSON with two major workflows. Someone may be doing Ajax functionality 
in the browser and that untrusted JSON gets sent to the server. The other use case is when we have untrusted data in our database and we're assembling a JSON object and we're then sending it down to the browser. So the JSON sanitizer class from OWASP can be used in both of those use cases to allow for more high performance computing. So number one, if you have untrusted data that you're using to build a JSON object, you can sanitize it before you send it to the browser. So it's pre-sanitized JSON. And then in your browser, you can grab that JSON and use eval to parse it. And that's super fast. And eval normally would cause code to execute. So we usually avoid this. But if you do JSON sanitization first, you can eval that JSON safely. And this is, again, the whole goal here is to provide an ultra high performance architecture so your applications will stand the test of time. The other use case is when you're taking untrusted data and sending it to the server. Now on the server, I receive your untrusted JSON, I can sanitize it to make it uh, well formed in case the attacker adds a script attack to it. Done, I'm now safe from these kinds of attacks. Make sense, any questions on that? Or? This is another project from Mike Samuel, it's called the, um, the JSON Sanitizer Project. When given JSON-like content, it converts it to well-formed valid JSON. It can be attached to either end of the pipeline on input or on output. Um, and if it's, if it's a, this is my favorite, the fourth bullet. If it's applied to output before you send it to the browser from the server, it will coerce minor mistakes in coding and make it easier to embed the JSON in HTML and also lets you use eval, which is a much faster way to parse. And I like this, this is a neat principle, the Postel's principle. Be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you take. I live life pretty much the opposite, but that's a separate, that's between me and my therapist. Moving on, moving on. So what else we got? We got jQuery. So who here uses jQuery in their work? By the way, I was telling you a joke, you forgot to laugh. I mean, laugh? So use jQuery, it's almost ubiquitous in the web. Everyone uses it. Um, most people use it for, for a, a website development. So you know, here's safe uses of jQuery, element.txt. That, that will safely render data in a text-only way and encode it properly. What about element.html? Why is that dangerous? I'm sorry? Exactly, if I get a script tag in there or some event handler, it will execute in some way. So we see this in use a lot. So to do safe use of jQuery, we need to avoid certain APIs. And so there's actually quite a few APIs in the world of jQuery that are very dangerous. Dot .add, dot .after, dot .animate, dot .append, dot .append to, dot .insert after, dot .insert before, all dangerous APIs. Also different jQuery methods that redirect that uh, if an untrusted variable goes there, it may redirect to another, another site. So jQuery is working on this problem. They're adding their own sanitizer inside of jQuery. And I'm skeptical it's gonna work, we'll see. We'll find out in jQuery 1.9 and 2.0 where this stuff should first pop. How, how much time do I have, may, may I ask? How are we doing on time? Ten minutes? Excellent. Any questions so far? Charge? So that's, that's what we have for today. I'm going to end this with, what about tomorrow? Because if we have to do this and this and this and this with every, and are we going to teach every single developer to code this way? Things, we should, I agree, I'm trying. I, I've gotten to about 10,000 developers so far. I have about 19 to 20 million left to go. So I think that what it really takes to stop cross-site scripting today is incredibly complex and too complex for most developers to grasp all of it. And it's, they, have, they have to put their attention on other things. And this is a, there's a lot going on to get this fixed. To stop SQL injection, you, do, you, you parameterize your query and you're done.
Hey man, business pressure, that's life. Hey, I'm married, you wanna talk about business pressure, oh my gosh. So, I mean, that's just the reality of how people code. So my goal is, in the future, to add this kind of defense into frameworks automatically. And there are standards emerging which give you this defense fairly easily. So today I do a lot of encoding and validation and all these things I'm talking about. But tomorrow I hope for something different. And so here's one major um, architectural artifact or architectural design that's really critical. It's called a context-aware auto-escaping template. So do you know what I mean by a user interface template? What are some examples of user interface templates? Like a PHP file, that's data from your database plus HTML merged together, that's a template. A Java server page, right? Apache Velocity. I'm sorry? Pyjamas? That's what it's called, pyjamas? So that's a formal templating language, right? And so my hope is that these, in the future, these templating languages will detect when untrusted data lands in certain slots in the page and automatically encode or validate based on the context and type of data. This is called an auto-escaping template. So the programmer just builds his user interface, gets it to work, and the XSS protection is automatic. So in Google, there's this project called the the CSAS project is the Context Sensitive auto sensitization Project. It runs at the compilation stage and it adds different sanitizers into the template at compile time. And so when you're compiling a template, if you do an illegal context or put untrusted data in, a, uh, in an open slot that they don't have an encoder for, it will not let you compile the template. You're only allowed to compile a template with safe slots like we talked about throughout the day. So then the programmer just uses this tool and the defense is added automatically. Now this is not ready for prime time. It's not very, it's mature but not complete yet. This is the hope for the future. I'm predicting the future here. And uh, our friend Jeff Ikonowski at OWASP who also wrote the Java encoder, he wrote his own templating language which, which uses his Java encoder and automatically implies the encoder based on where the untrusted data lands within the HTML document. This is the future. Let's build frameworks for developers to give them the security automatically as best as possible. We'll, it will take years before this is in play. We're working on it though, we're working on it. Um, I, I, this is the, the current CSAS is in C++, it's a C++ template. It's very rare where people do C++ web development. And uh, it's just not a, a production-ready tool that I see in more common frameworks. It's more obscure right now. There are very few users using JXT right now. It's more of a, re it's, it's production quality. It's in use in some big sites, but not enough. Like, it's not like native in struts or native in spring or native in the wicket architecture. When these defenses are in our common architectures and, and they're production ready, then they'll be really ready. It'll take a few years before we get there. When you tell a developer you can only put untrusted data in these 10 slots, you also limit how they can develop. And so it's, a, it's tough to keep up with those developers. It's a tricky problem. I don't see it being solved for many years. I, I, I agree. I agree with you. Why he did this is because he had, he was working at Success Factors at the time, and he had a large number of vulnerable Java server pages, and you can't just apply this to a JSP because those JSPs are unstructured. So he migrated, his company is part of a big project, they migrated a large number of JSPs to this technology because J, um, JXT is very close to JSP notation. It's meant to be used as a JSP replacement technology and he migrated all these insecure JSP pages to his templating language made specifically for this kind of migration. 
And so it's just a, a one step in the right direction that he did. It's a good research project. It works for his use case. If, if you want to work on it, it's a reasonable templating language. But he has other work to do. He, he stopped going to Apache. He didn't go to Apache or other places. But he got us a few steps down the, down the field. So I give him some credit. He, he's a, he only has so much time. Two babies now. So busy, busy man. Some, Mike, Michael Samuel is picking this up. What Michael Samuel is doing is he's writing a higher level language that provides encoding rules for any language or any templating. So there's still work being done in this area. It's incredibly challenging, yo. It's gonna take years to develop. And here's the trade-offs is that, you know you, know, you can no longer do free and loose coding like a JSP or a PHP file. It does require extra time to develop, but it does increase quality. It requires the developers to be more meticulous in their templating because it ha has to compile and be perfect before it will work. Where in JSPs, you can get your HTML all screwed up and it doesn't care. It spits it out. The browser doesn't care. If the browser gets really bad HTML, it tries to fix it, you know? But, and when you're developing this way with the, com with the compliant template, your template must be in perfect form. Um, and these technologies often don't support complex contexts like an HTML input or how to parse JSON right, these other edge cases. And so some of these templates are not even context aware. It's not that good. Like struts is not context aware, but it gives you basic encoding in a couple slots, in a couple widgets within, uh, within struts. Um, and some of these templates let you disable auto escaping. So if the developer can disable it, that's, what's the point in that? He'll, they'll, they'll, when, when developers are allowed to, they'll turn off security. Some encode wrong, and some will just reject the template if it doesn't recognize different contexts. That's my preference for this kind of, for this kind of technology. We also have content security policy. I'm not going to talk about it in that, in that much depth. When are you up? Morning. So Thursday, what, what was your name again? I'm, Lieben. I'm sorry? Lieben. How do you, Lieben? Lieben. Lieben? So Lieben's going to talk about content security policy in great detail Thursday morning. I highly encourage you to go. Let me, let me just get the, the story started a little bit. And I'll let you finish it. So content security policy is a W3C standard. It's a response header. So when you're rendering a web page, when you're sending a web page to the browser as a developer, you can enable a header that says, turn on content security policy. And so the best kind of content security policy is when you disallow scripts to execute in the body of your page. To do that though, as a developer, you must move all of your JavaScript to a separate JS file that's called externalizing JavaScript. What do you think of that? How many of you embed JavaScript into your web page still? You know better. You know better. And you're good. Teach us content security policy. I got my eye on your code. My, my latest website is two years old, so that, that was a uh, that's, I, I forgive you. <laughs> so if you take all of your JavaScript and put it in a separate JS file, it's better for performance. You can cache it. It's faster. It's just a better way to code, regardless of security. But if you do that, you can also enable content security policy. And uh, it's the script source directive. You say script source that doesn't allow unsafe inline eliminates a huge class of stored reflective XSS. But you must promise not to write inline JavaScript. I was a consultant like six years ago writing code. And one of the rules was, do not write inline JavaScript. You must use separate JS files. It was in my contract. And so I got caught doing it. Um, and they were like, and my boss, who's a friend of mine, he was like, well, Jim, you broke your contract. You have two choices. I'm not going to pay you at all today, or I want you to write on the board. And we had a big programmer area. And we had a big whiteboard. You need to write this on the board 100 times. I will not write inline JavaScript. I'll pay you to do it, but you either do it on the board or I'm not going to pay you for today. <laughs> so guess what I did? I, don't know, I will not write. <laughs> and people are taking pictures of me and laughing. And this, and that's all right. It's all it's part of the fun. You got to be a good spirit. So I personally, I will not write inline JavaScript ever again. I learned my lesson. And that makes content security policy much easier to implement. So I'm, I'm sorry? Oh, 
Well, I, I didn't catch that. One more time? No, no, go ahead, yo. It's all right. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> uh, I just wrote it on the board. <laughs> it was, it was a, it was all, in, it was in good fun. And it, 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 I, I was one of the team leaders. I wanted to encourage everyone else not to do it, so I let myself, you know, be on the cross a little bit, and it stopped a lot more, more than just me. It stopped all of us from doing it, so I don't care. We see content security policy in the real world. Twitter is one of the biggest users of content security policy across major websites. And this is the policy that they're, this is the policy that one of the policies they're using today. All right, content security policy test. You wanna give us, you wanna show us your expertise at content security policy? What would this report look like? Want to go for two? What does this one do? Uh, it fits in my script in the, in the base page. So my hope in the future, and, and you know your stuff. So th this is actually a very complex topic. I don't want to talk about it anymore. If you want to learn more about content security policy, go listen to him talk Thursday morning. So my hope for the future is that all of this complexity will reduce to auto-escaping templates, content security policy, those two things alone has a chance to stop a huge amount of cross-site scripting. The other thing we have to worry about is DOM-based XSS and untrusted JavaScript. What if you have an advertisement widget that has JavaScript in it? How do you render that on your page safely? There's no good answer to that today. There's no good way to do that in a safe fashion. So we see Douglas Crockford, the inventor of JavaScript, he's working on AdSafe to allow us to sandbox third-party JavaScript in a safer way. I've also begged Michael Samuel to give us a JavaScript sanitization engine to allow us to take third-party JavaScript. There's also the topic of DOM XSS, which content security policy does not address. If you have an XSS deep in JavaScript, I can get through content security policy pretty easily. Same thing with auto-escaping templates. Um, they're usually not aware of deep JavaScript problems and they won't be for some time. So in the future, we'll still have to worry about this, but the rest of this will be handled for us, is my hope. And with that, I'm done. So any questions about this, I'm always excited to answer questions. I'm jim at owas.org. I highly recommend you security-minded developers to look at the OWASP XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet and the OWASP DOM-based XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet. Much of this material came from those guides and it's a much more detailed guide to help you and other developers eliminate XSS from your applications. Any questions or? Yeah, so um, very simple to do. Let me, let me show you this. So we have this tool called the HTML sanitizer, right? So this tool, so suppose you have um, HTML uh, saved in your database, so, or even just a large chunk of text in your database. You can use this tool, set a policy to what should be legal HTML, and you can then select the content in your database and pull it out one field at a time and run it through the sanitizer to see if it changes. It, 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 that's one way. And um, Arshan from Aspect, he, uh, he, he used anti-SAMI and built a little tool to do this. You can use this as well. You can use JSOUP as well. It's just, a par it's just a content parser, mostly for markup, and you take the original, run it through the sanitizer. If they're not equal, you may have XSS in your database. It requires some work to make that effective, but it's not that difficult. You have to tune it with different policies and some false flags come out, but that, that's the basic architecture of how to do that. That's the performance issue if you have a very large database. 
Well, it's meant to be done, it's meant for offline checking for XSS. But even better, dude, just do your output encoding. Who cares if it's in your database? If you do your output encoding properly, it's assuming that an attack will reach that user interface and it, and it sanitizes it safely and you're good to go. That's the best way to go, I think. Any other questions? We're done. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Aloha.